We are continuing our journey through the book of Mark. Um, so I put these together weeks, sometimes months ago, and um, I create outlines and I do scripture and and then I come back to it. This week I came back to this sermon and I was putting it together and nothing seemed to fit. It was kind of one of those odd things. Like I thought to myself, what was I thinking? But I think part of it was is that my world was kind of discombobulated. I didn't have to take a kid anywhere after Tuesday. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have to make a meal for anybody else. I only had to feed myself. It was a strange week for me. So I think I was upset in that regard. So if this doesn't make much sense, I apologize. So today, uh, we are going to take a look at uh, opposition that Jesus faced, uh, parables that he taught with, and miracles that occurred. So I want to start with uh, opposition that Jesus faced. Now, throughout Mark, we see that there is opposition for Jesus as he is in the midst of his ministry. In fact, that opposition becomes so great that they put him to death. We know the end of the story, but I wanted to kind of look at where that opposition began and kind of talk about the fact that when you are in the midst of um, leading a group of people or a ministry or uh, area of your life, occasionally, as the leader, not occasionally, all the time, you will face opposition. So opposition comes in many different forms and from many different areas, and sometimes it's surprising where it comes from. So in today's story, we see a, a couple of different ways that opposition came at Jesus. And one of the ways that we see that opposition came at Jesus in, in our full readings of uh, chapters 3 through 6, we see that one of the places that opposition came from was from his own family. So he's there, he's... Uh, He's preaching, he's healing people. It is so busy, the story tells us, that he is not taking the time to eat, to take care of himself. There are so many people present that he is just continually working. It's the beginning of his ministry. Things are really starting to ramp up. And his family says, that's it, we're coming we're going to get you out of there. We're going to get you a meal. We're going to take care of you. They were concerned for his well-being, for his health, for his safety. And I, I, could, I, I can relate to that completely. Um, when Marla and I went into ministry, there were people who were opposed to us leaving where we were in Michigan and setting aside everything and going into full-time ministry. And we had to make that difficult conversation with both of our parents. And uh, we, I don't even know which parents we told first. I, I wanna say it was my parents. And we told my parents, and my parents said, well, good luck. If you need anything, let us know. Remember, I said, I come from a crazy group of people. I was born to crazy people, and I am raising crazy people. So there was kind of this just acceptance of, well, yeah, he's gone crazy, but it'll be okay. But then we had to go and tell Marla's mom and dad, and he is about um, financial stability and knowing, having a plan for the future. Well, when you go into ministry full time, there is no plan for the future. You can say that there's a plan, but really there's no plan. 
If you'd have said to me then, you're going to live in Ohio for the next 20 plus years, and you're going to be in ministry there, and you're going to live in this town called Delight, I'd have said, no way. But here I am. When you go into ministry, you don't always get to choose where you're going, and you just have to follow where God is calling you to go. And Marla said to her dad, I'm going to quit my job as a teacher. And he said, what? How are you going to live? Well, we don't exactly know how we're going to pay the bills. You want to really make your father-in-law mad? You just say, I don't exactly know how we're paying the bills. But we're going to sell the house too. Where are you going to live? I don't exactly know where we're going to live. But it's going to be okay. We're going to start this adventure. Holy cow. I don't know if he contemplated calling children's services on us, but boy, it might have been close. He was really concerned for our well-being and our safety. And as a father, I understand that. But as somebody who was going into ministry, you just have to keep going. And we see that in the story of Jesus where even though his family opposes what it is that he is doing, he continues to be about the ministry that he's been called to do. And sometimes in life, when we choose to do things, people think we're, well, unstable, a little odd. We go a direction that isn't expected of us. Everybody has a picture of how each of us thinks about the other. And when we go off the rails, people have a tendency to go, oh, that's too bad. They kind of shake their heads. And the reality is, if you're doing what you think God has created you to be, then you are exactly where you are supposed to be. I have said this before, and I will say it again. I could never be a missionary in a foreign country. But there are people who are just absolutely made to do that. They are made to live in the worst conditions and to help people learn about God. I could never do that because it's not how God has created me to be. But there are people who go and do that. Uh, I could never be a kindergarten teacher. I could never be a bus driver. I'd be in the headlines, teacher arrested, bus driver taken into custody. I don't think I could handle it. But yet there are people who do it every day, and they're called to that. And they deserve sainthood for that. You see, when... When we do that thing which God has called us to do, it gains momentum. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But, but what Jesus did with the opposition was he just kept going. He just kept doing ministry. We read this week that he went to his hometown and miracles couldn't be performed. There were just some minor healings. And as I read that, I thought, well, what is going on here? And then at the very end of that little reading, it was because of the lack of faith that the people who knew him the best had in him. It was their lack of faith that kept the miracles from happening. It was their lack of faith that kept the healing from happening. Sometimes it's our faith that allows us to do what other people think is impossible, to do what other people think we shouldn't do. And I know that each of you has an area in your life where you enjoy the work that you do. Whether it be uh, talking to neighbors or, or visiting with friends, baking cookies, 
cooking food for people, helping somebody cut their grass or take care of their yard. We've talked about this before. All of those are places where you go and you lead. And all of those places are important to God. And so when people come to me and say, I could never do that, I try and say to them, I could never do what it is that you do. What you do is important to God. And it is a ministry that is yours. And you've got to overcome the opposition that you face. Now, as we go through this, we, we saw a little piece of it as the leaders in the community were saying that Jesus was really of the devil. And that opposition begins to take root and take hold and to grow. And we see throughout the rest of Mark where that opposition gets stronger and stronger and stronger and eventually leads to Calvary. It's part of the story. But I think God wants us to see that we're not alone as we face opposition, as we go through difficult times. So Jesus did face opposition, and if you are going to be doing work for God, and if you are going to be in any kind of leadership position, you will face opposition. And the reality is, if you know what you are doing is right, you have to keep going. We could have stopped right there in Michigan and not gone any farther. We could have heeded the warning about our financial stability, our lack of housing, our lack of a plan. But yet we felt God's call enough to keep going. And I want to encourage you to listen where God is taking you and to keep going because you're important to the kingdom of heaven. So, Jesus teaches in parables these stories. And the stories, without explanation, are sometimes very odd. You know, this whole idea of a mustard seed, the smallest seed creating a plant that is large enough that it even shades the birds and the birds can nest in it. And it's really simple and straightforward, but the deeper you dig into this story, kind of the more that's there. And so this week, as I was digging into the mustard seed story, I, I kind of looked at something a little bit different. And so I began to look at mustard and mustard seeds and mustard plants and how much and how invasive they can be. So if you take, <laughs> and really you can get a package of 5,000 mustard seeds in a little tiny envelope. If you take those and you put them somewhere that's not going to get mown and you let them go, you will literally have hundreds of thousands of mustard plants in just a few years. Hundreds of thousands of mustard plants. It will take over a whole pasture. It will take over a whole field. It will be an absolute mess. The little yellow flowers, they're beautiful to look at, but man, if that's not what you want, it is a real disaster, and it is very difficult to get rid of. You have to cut it down and cut it down and cut it down year after year after year after year. And when I look at that parable, I begin to look at the seed, the seed itself. If I'm the seed, if I'm the mustard seed, because really isn't that kind of what the parable is saying, that the seeds are planted. We see it later on uh, as we read here in Mark about the parable of the seeds and 
where the seed falls and whether it falls on good soil or bad soil or whether it gets choked out by weeds. If we're the seed, and the plants are the kingdom of God, when we really look at it, that is how Christianity spreads. So we see Jesus, and he has 12 disciples. Let's say he has 24 or 30 people close to him, 12 disciples, and then some other people who are kind of ancillary, who are close workers and how that has become a religion that literally covers our globe. It is like a weed that has been set free that has gone nuts. When I first moved into the parsonage here, I was warned. There are thistles, picker bushes, picker plant, weeds. They were weeds. They hurt your feet when you step on them. You know what I'm talking about. They're everywhere. You'll never get rid of them. Oh, why did you say that to my wife? And so it became our mission to begin to remove these thorny weeds from our yard. And so it began. And we would go out early Just a few weeks from now, we'll be out there looking. Because, see, the seeds lie dormant. They don't always germinate all the seeds every year. And we take them out individually. We we don't use weed killer, or I don't like to use weed killer. So here I am out in the yard the first year pulling these Thorny plants, one at a time. And then the next year and the year after and the year after that, and every year it's gotten less and less. Last year I think I took out six. It's been great. But this year she will see one somewhere in our yard. And it will be my responsibility to go out there and pull them all, find every last one of them to get them out to uproot them. It's a ministry that I've taken on, not by choice, but by force. And I'm content with that. It's okay. But it's a lot of work. So ministry works in the opposite way. Ministry works in you do one thing and it becomes many things. So in my research this week, uh, I found a a mattress guy, a a guy who owns a furniture business in Houston, Texas. And so when Hurricane Katrina hit, and there were people coming from Louisiana to Houston, he opened up his furniture stores. Now, He wasn't a Ashley furniture guy. He wasn't even a Westrich furniture guy. I saw in one of the news reels, um, one of the videos, I saw a couch, just the couch, for $9,000, and I saw a bed for $12,000. Just the mattress, not the frame, not the box springs, just the mattress, $12,000. It wasn't a queen, it wasn't a king, it was a twin. And I thought, yikes. So he was more on the high end of furniture, and he invited the people who were coming from Louisiana to Houston to stay in his furniture store and warehouse until they could figure out what they were doing. He opened his store. He opened two of his stores. And there were probably between, they figured there were between 300 and 400 people who took advantage of it from Louisiana. And then 
I don't know if you remember this, but Harvey hit Houston. And Houston was flooded. And even though one of his own stores was flooded, his big store that had the 100,000 square foot showroom with a warehouse in the back wasn't damaged at all. And he invited the people of Houston to come to his furniture store. And the people came. They figure over a thousand people went through the two furniture stores that he opened up. And as he was doing it, he would call restaurants that were in the area to help provide food. They became a distribution point for cleaning supplies and for food and for paper products and for water. Thousands of people went through his stores, donated stuff for the community. For the first 24 hours of Harvey, he did not go to sleep. He's in his 70s currently. And, you know, all the local people knew him, but there was somebody who came from, I don't know if it was ABC or CBS, from the national desk, you know, that person who doesn't have a clue What's happening in Houston? And they said, why are you doing this? And he said, because it's what my parents would want me to do. Because it's the right thing. It's what people do for other people. And they interviewed different people, people who were sleeping in the store, people who were serving food, people who were bringing in donations, and they interviewed one of his workers during the Harvey storm. And the young man had come during the Katrina storm and had stayed in his store. And they had had conversation and he'd been hired to work. And he said, this man got me an apartment and he furnished it. And he put me to work. And he said, it changed my family's life. One person, one person, one seed, And all of those people who were affected, all of those people who became seeds from that plant that spread to other places. You see, as you do one good thing, as you do one thing, the parable is saying to us that just one little tiny seed can affect everything. Because one seed creates one plant that creates thousands of seeds. And those thousands of seeds become hundreds of plants that create hundreds of thousands of seeds. And that's how it spreads. It's really simple. Just do what's right. Do what God is calling you to do. I believe the parables that Jesus is teaching us have so many different meanings, so many different ways to interpret And I think that's the beauty of the parable system. On a simple level, you can tell it to a child, and the child learns something from it. And you can tell it to an adult, and an adult learns something different. And you can tell it to somebody who has listened to it a hundred times, and this time I heard something completely different. It's amazing. Jesus teaches in parables because there are layers to them. And God wants us to continue to learn and grow and be better. And finally today, we're going to talk about miracles. Um, There are some big miracles coming up. I looked ahead, and I'm like, why didn't I make miracles next week? Like, there's feedings of thousands of people next week. That's a miracle. But the miracle that I want to talk to you about today is the miracle of Jesus with his disciples on the water. He's asleep in the boat. And a storm blows up. And his disciples get very nervous. And the storm gets worse. And finally they wake him up. And he calms the storm. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the power that it would take to calm a storm? To make a storm completely stop? And when a storm completely stops... It's eerie. 
Have you ever been there? Have you ever seen it happen? When things go quiet and you think, I should probably seek shelter. I'm sure that's how Jesus' disciples felt in that boat. Who is this that can even calm a storm? And we see as we read through the Old Testament, we see those places where God shows himself going across the waters and calming the wind and the sea. We see it in the Psalms and we see it in Genesis. And Jesus is showing his disciples who he is. You see, the miracles that occurred lead us to think about who is Jesus, the Son of God. They help us to see that. They help us to know that. They help us to understand that. We see it in the woman who was healed, bleeding for 12 years, unclean for 12 years, And she just thought, if I can only touch his cloak, I'll be healed. And it was so, and he knew. For her, that was more than a healing, that was a miracle. For those of you who have chronic diseases, imagine if this moment, right here, right now, your disease was taken away. Your chronic illness was removed. Your chronic pain was gone. It wouldn't just be a healing for you. It would be a miracle. I have seen people who have had chronic pain and the suffering that it brings in their life and how they suffer in silence because they know that people get tired of hearing about their pain. And God saw the suffering. He saw the miracle that happened in her world and in her life. Yep, it's a healing, but it's a miracle for her. No, there's going to be opposition when you're doing God's work. No, that there are many layers to the gospel. And that just because you're here and somebody else is over here doesn't mean you're not both looking at the same parable, just on different levels. And no, that the miracles that started in that boat that day when the sea was calmed opened up the floodgates for many miracles to come. Keep looking for God's miracles in this world. Sometimes they'll happen through you, just like some guy in Houston, Texas, that sells way too expensive of mattresses. But he was able to touch and help his community with God's love because it was the right thing to do. Miracles happen today. We just need to see them. Will you pray with me? God of grace and mercy, thank you. Thank you for helping us to be the best that we can be. Help us to keep going through the opposition. Help us to seek your miracles and to learn from your stories where you would have us be and go. Thank you for always being with us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
go forth from this place and build upon the rock that is Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.